so uh, my, my brother is a huge Cubs fan, and I'm staying with him in Chelsea, and so it was a long night last night, um, and uh, totally interrupted my sleep schedule, so I only got a, a couple hours of sleep. That's fine for, but it's just, I often lose my voice when I'm going over to little sleep, so hopefully I won't get too hoarse, but you'll know what's going on if that happens. Um, so it's very nice to be here. Thank you very much for the uh, invitation. I've actually never been to the Graduate uh, Center before, but it seems like a fantastic place. So I'm very happy to be here. So there's a noticeable pattern in the history of constitutional rights. The 14th Amendment was adopted in six, uh, 1868 to guarantee to all persons, and specifically newly freed slaves, the right of due process and equal protection of the laws. In the 1880s, these rights were extended to corporations. And in the subsequent two decades, 19 suits were brought by African Americans under the amendment, and 288 were brought by corporations. In 1791, the First Amendment was adopted. In 1976, the court overruled earlier precedent and began to extend First Amendment protection to commercial speech, including the speech of corporations, and corporate free speech cases began to rise. Notoriously, in 2010, in the Citizens United case, corporations were extended First Amendment protection of their political speech as well. Corporations now account for almost half of the First Amendment challenges in federal court, and the trend line points up. We are witnessing, as John Coates puts it, the corporate takeover of the First Amendment. Corporations have also secured Fourth, Fifth, Sixth, and Seventh Amendment rights. In instance after instance, we see rights, one for natural persons, being subsequently exploited by and dominated by corporate persons. In constitutional law classes, we teach the Bill of Rights, the 14th Amendment, and the post-war incorporation of the Bill of Rights through the 14th Amendment, so that it now applies against state and local governments as well as against the federal government, as a story about the expansion of individual liberty. But if we look at the longer-term consequences, we see that it is even more a story about corporate empowerment, which on its flip side means contraction of individual liberty. Small business owners are squeezed, corporate workers are squeezed, and citizens' voices in the electoral process and the legislative process are diminished. So I'm a teetotaler when it comes to constitutional rights for corporations. I don't think there should be any. Uh, this may sound like an extreme view with radical consequences, but it is not. First of all, the United States is one of the few countries that grants its corporations constitutional rights, yet corporations are hardly under siege around the world. Second, through much of its history, the U.S. did not grant them constitutional rights, yet still they thrive. Third, many of their key property rights are already well protected in the common law. And fourth, any additional rights we believe they should have can be enacted by statute. My only claim is that these should not have constitutional status. So doctrinally, how has the extension of constitutional rights to corporations been justified? The US Constitution makes no mention of corporations or corporate rights. Therefore, to make the case that corporations have constitutional rights, one has to make some connection between corporations and natural persons, such that the constitutional rights of the latter can be imputed to the former. This is exactly what the court has been doing, although not in the way commonly believed. The popular view is that the court is treating corporations as if they were citizens. The more sophisticated scholarly view is that, in at least some of the court's decisions over the years, it has treated the corporation as an individual person within the meaning of the constitutional text, especially within the meaning of the 14th Amendment's protection of persons, and apply these protections to the corporation through a kind of linguistic sleight of hand in other words, treating the corporation, which is a contracting entity or person, as if it had the status of a constitutional person. But in fact, the court has never done either of these things in its 200-year history of providing constitutional rights to corporations. What the court has instead always done is justify extending constitutional rights to corporations by reducing the corporation to an association of natural persons or citizens. Namely, the court has looked past the corporation proper, that is the corporate entity, which bears the corporation's property and contracting rights, and looked straight to its shareholders, which it sees as both the corporation's owners and members. Indeed, a justice such as Scalia appears to believe the court is not granting rights to corporations at all, but simply vindicating the constitutional rights of these shareholder owner members, who, in its view, comprise the corporation. Looking past the supposed fiction of corporate personhood, the corporation is just an association of natural persons like a partnership. 
I'll just mention a couple examples. In 1892, Justice Field made the argument that would lead to corporations receiving their first rights under the Constitution. Uh, we can quarrel about what were the first, but this is a, a pretty good uh, uh, example. Uh, this, uh, quote, so far as the property is concerned, Field argued, corporations, no less than natural persons, uh, enjoy 14th Amendment due process protection and equal protection of the laws. And let's see if we get the direction the right way. And as he says here, it would be a most singular result of the constitutional provision intended for the protection of every person against partial and discriminating legislation by the states should cease to exert such protection the moment the person becomes a member of the corporation. That's my bold. Um, we cannot accept such a c conclusion. Uh, this, he continued, is because the property of the corporation is, in fact, the property of the corporators. Uh, so here we see the assumption that shareholders are both the owners and the members of the corporation. The same assumption continues to underwrite the court's reasoning about corporations through, through the whole you know, 19th, 20th century, down to our own day, as we can see in a case such as the Citizens, Citizens United. Kennedy complains that wealthy individuals and unincorporated associations can spend unlimited amounts on independent expenditures, while associations of citizens that have taken on the corporate form are prevented. Right? So again, the assumption is the corporation's funds are just shareholder funds, and the funds, uh, the funds of citizens and associations. Meanwhile, in his concurring opinion, Scalia argues that the authorized spokesman of a corporation is a human being who speaks on behalf of the human beings who form that association, just as the spokesman of an unincorporated association speaks on behalf of its members. Uh, so again, we see the corporation here being treated as nothing but an association of humans formed by its members. So to summarize, the court supposes, first, that the shareholders own the assets of the corporation, and that therefore constitutional protection of corporate property is just constitutional protection of the property of individual shareholders. And it supposes, second, that the business corporation is a member corporation with the shareholders as members, that the speech rights of the member corporation are just the speech rights of its members as individuals, and that a corporate spokesperson exercises these rights on their behalf. Okay, so in other words, the court is treating a corporation as if it were a kind of partnership. I hear diagrammed a partnership and what the court is imagining is that the shareholders are just like the partners, and the shareholders own the assets of the corporation. Okay? Uh, and they're also the members of it, just like the partner members are members of the partnership. So a general partnership may fairly be described as an association of individuals. The partnership's property is the partner's property, the partners are the members of the partnership, and their rights are the partnership's rights. Thus, I have no problem with the funds of partnerships being used for electioneering, that is, assuming we're going to grant that, that money is speech, um, as long as all the partners are citizens, because the partnership funds really are the funds of these citizens. But the story is very different for corporations. They are not just glorified partnerships, as the court seems to think. To understand a corporation, let's first consider an example with which we are all familiar. So, uh, Cooney would be a bit more complicated. Imagine this is a private university. Okay. In fact, the Latin word for corporation is universitas, which is the root of the word university. It means uh, uni, one, so it's things turned into one. Um, in this case, universitas scholarium, a group of scholars turned into one. That's the original notion of a university. So, in that case, so it's, you know, I used to think university meant we were all aspiring for universal knowledge, and it really just means corporation. <laughs> um, so, assuming it's a private university, so who would own this lectern? Right? And you really think about it, you're, no natural person owns this lectern. There is an abstract legal entity, the corporation, that owns uh, this lectern. It is, in famous words of John Marshall, uh, 19th century, early 19th century Supreme Court Justice, invisible, intangible, existing only in contemplation of the law. The corporation as a legal entity is just an abstract uh, legal thing. Uh, so the first attribute we have of a corporation uh, is, I prefer to call it like contracting individuality, or you can call it juridical personhood, uh, and it, it owns property, makes contracts, appearance in court in its own name with properties and liabilities wholly separate from all natural persons, okay, separate legal entity. Uh, second, you will recognize that a university is entitled to make rules beyond the law of the land, we all love to live under them, uh, say work rules or campus ban on smoking. Uh, it's a little government. Unlike a truly private association, these rules are enforceable in court. 
right? A chess club meeting in a public park can't enforce a no smoking rule. I mean, it just dissolves the group. You can't always enforce it, but you can take that to court for a corporation. So second, who has the authority to make these rules? To control the property and to control the property. Well, we know it's the board, right? Um, and then the interesting question is, who grants the board its authority? I'm oh, sorry, this, this slide is just showing different kinds of corporations, and they all have jurisdictions. That's, that's an essential feature of corporations. We, that's the big thing we forget. A corporation has a jurisdiction. It is a little government. Um, and so who grants the board its authority? Right? I never ever thought to ask that question. But it is, in fact, the state through the charter. The charter grants it that authority. So it is a mode of delegating government, governance power, a mode of delegating authority. Uh, so, so corporations are not really these private entities. They're a kind of hybrid. Um, they, you know, they get their legal form, they get their governing authority from the state, but their personnel is kind of privately recruited, their funding is, is private. Okay? Uh, they're little governments and they're franchisees of the state, so I've been dubbing them franchise governments. Um, it's not my topic today, but I believe this is fundamentally transforms how we understand modern society, which is actually much more medieval in its structure than we generally believe. <coughs> So unfortunately, as soon as we add shareholders to the picture, we start to get confused. But everything I've just said about the university is also true of a business corporation. Oh, so I was just going to show here. So those are the traits of a corporation. Those are also attributes of the state, right? And what distinguishes a corporation fundamentally from the state is only this, that it is legally subordinate to a state, has to abide by its laws, whether in the charter or the general laws of the land. Okay, if you think of how uh, medieval feudalism worked, it's actually very similar. All right, so here's the, uh, the business corporation, and the things in color are the only things that have changed. Uh, and you'll note here, from a legal point of view, this is the corporation, abstract, invisible, existing only in contemplation of the law, the legal entity. It is the legal entity that owns all the assets. The board has authority. It manages the property and assets on behalf of the corporation. All contracts are with this entity, right? You get your check from or you pay your bills to the entity, no natural person. Um, so, oh, and, and the other point of it is, is this is a, a, the separate rights uh, bearing entity, and it has its own rights and liabilities, totally separate from any natural person, and the natural person's rights do not pass through to it. That's not the way a corporation works, it's, it's just its rights separately in the law. So, we tend to miss this because of a quirk of the English language. Uh, and here's what I mean. So if you know, you think back to that other partnership diagram, or even we could substitute like a sole pro proprietor, we distinguish verbally between a sole proprietor and a sole proprietorship, right? which includes all the, say, the employees and the property of it. Okay? We distinguish between the partners and a partnership. Right? The partners are the sole owners and central contracting party of the partnership. Unfortunately, we don't distinguish between the corporation, which is the sole owner and central contracting party of the corporation ship. We don't have a word corporation ship. We use the same word for both things, corporation and corporation, although they're distinct. So just to not use a barbarism, I talk about the corporation and the corporate firm. Okay? Um, and the corporate firm is an association, including this abstract legal entity. The corporation is not an association. It is an abstract legal entity. So how does ownership work here? Uh, again, the corporation owns all of the assets. Shareholders do not own, or stockholders do not own uh, the assets. They don't have rights to use the corporate property, to borrow it, to lend it out to others, to exclude others from it, etc. They have none of the rights of the property with respect to it. The corporation has all those rights. Um, secondly, shareholders and membership. Shareholders are not the members. Uh, if the man in the street were asked, who are the members of a corporation, he would likely look at the questioner in puzzlement. <coughs> and that is the correct answer. <laughs> because, uh, properly speaking, uh, and he would have business corporations in mind, they do not have uh, members. Uh, historically, and in a few isolated pockets today, there are indeed corporations with members. And I dub these member corporations. We don't have this distinction. I'm distinguished between member corporations and property corporations. We don't have this distinguished in English, but it's, we have it in other languages, and it's very important. Uh, I hope you hear more about it because I, I plan to write more about it. Uh, so I dub these member corporations. The Latin is an universitas personarum, an incorporation of people. 
Examples would be the medieval uh, towns and guilds and back when faculty enjoyed governance control in medieval universities. We're also a member of corporations. They've changed a lot. Uh, defining features of a membership and membership corporation I take to be these. The members jointly control the membership. The rule for voting is one member, one vote. Right? So members would be let in on majority vote or kicked out on majority vote. Uh, and the members establish a government over themselves. Blackstone refers to them as little republics. There is another form of corporation that was developed in the canon law. I call it the property corporation. That's just a translation of Latin, the universitas rerum, incorporation of things. An early example was a bishopric. It had property, and it had an office holder, but it had no members. And I would hold that the business corporation is of this type. Shareholders do not meet the test of corporate membership. They don't jointly control who else becomes a shareholder. Shares are freely tradable. Each individual changes or you know, sells a share and you have to get a new shareholder. Uh, they don't operate in principle one member, one vote. It's one share, one vote. And they don't elect a government over themselves. It's one group that elects a government over another group, the employees. So it's a kind of imperial autocracy relationship rather than a little republic. So the shareholders are really just outside investors, not members. Many of us in this room are probably shareholders through our retirement accounts. Does anyone feel like they are a member of these corporations or even know which ones they own stock in? <laughs> okay, so why does the court adopt this view without explanation or argument that the business corporation is a member corporation and the shareholders are its members? So I feel it is incumbent upon me to explain how otherwise reasonable people could get something wrong, and I feel that that ultimately strengthens my own argument. So a lot of the, the work behind it, the paper that's distributed was just figuring out this, the answer to this question. The paper goes into more detail, I can just telegraph my answer here. The first thing to know is that at some point between the high middle ages and the early modern period, the English lost their grip on the concept of a property corporation, that is, an incorporation of property without members. This doesn't mean that things like bishoprics and other church benefices disappeared. Rather, the English reinterpreted them as member corporations by treating their office holder as members. So the bishop becomes a, the sole member of the bishopric. This gives rise to the curious English concept of the corporation soul. Initially, the king is treated as a corporation soul. This is a one-person corporation. So the bishop is a corporation soul. The king is a corporation soul. The loss of the concept of a property, corpora the property corporation also led to the business corporation being treated in Anglo-American legal tradition as a member corporation. The story of how this happened takes us back to the early modern trading companies. So I'm going to tell that story in very brief terms. So the first modern business corporation of note was the Dutch East India Company, uh, or VOC, founded in 1602. Initially, it was not a business corporation, but more of a legalized cartel of six pre-existing partnerships that traded in the Indies. However, by 1623, it had been transformed into a property corporation. I don't have time to go into the details of, of what occurred and, and why, but I'll just make two points. First of all, the stockholders knew very well that they did not own the assets of this corporation. In 1612, all assets, that was like 10, minutes, 10 years into its term, uh, all assets were supposed to have been liquidated and returned to the investors. Instead, the stockholders were blatantly expropriated. Assets were permanently locked in as permanent capital that could be augmented indefinitely. This is just what you needed to build fortifications and maintain them in, in Asia to, to make war and money at the same time. That was the, the mission. The howls of the shareholders were only quieted by a dividend of 162.5%. <laughs> uh, but they knew they weren't owners, right? Second, no one ever thought to refer to them as the members of the corporation. The Dutch word is lid. No, that's never used for that. They had no control over whom else could become a stockholder, since the shares were freely tradable. That was a VOC innovation. And they had no say in the government of the corporation. The board members were selected by the burgomeisters of the leading Dutch cities. And it wasn't a government over themselves, but over employees. The stockholders were seen for what they were outside investors. The confusion starts with the English East India Company. It was first chartered in 1600, actually two years before the, the VOC. Uh, and unlike the VOC, it was a chartered corporation but not a business corporation, as we understand it today, but as a kind of member corporation. Specifically, it was chartered as a regulated company, uh, which is an extension of the classic merchant guild now applied to foreign trade. Uh, so the way that worked is the members of the guild have the right as individuals 
to trade to the Indies. As members, they elect a board to govern the trade, to set rules, standards, etc., for the trade to the Indies. They operated on a principle of one member, one vote. They collectively controlled the membership, and the government they elected was a government over themselves. They really were a corporation, a member corporation. In practice, however, no individual had the resources to equip a fleet to the Indies, so the members of the corporation organized themselves as a joint stock company uh, to conduct the trade. It was a partnership of corporate members, if, if you will. Uh, but as typical joint stock companies, these were one-shot trips, uh, with all asset assets liquidated with the return of the ships, including the ships themselves. Everything sold, divided up among the, the partners. There was no permanent body of capital. This was clearly an inferior vehicle for trade to the Indies, and the VOC consistently outcompeted them. In 1657, therefore, the EIC, East India English East India Company, rechartered and copied the VOC model. It already had legal personhood, and now adopted a permanent capital, separated stockholder management, exempted liability of the stockholders and the directors, and instituted tradable shares. Uh, there was only one difference from the VOC. The board continued to be elected by the stockholders, although now on the non-member principle of one share, one vote, rather than one shareholder, one vote. So at this point, the EIC too has become a property corporation. Members no longer jointly control the membership, they no longer operate on the principle of one member, one vote, and they no longer elect a government over themselves, but over employees. They were now simply outside investors. However, because the English had lost sight of the property corporation, one way or another, they were going to have to shoehorn this new corporation type into the member uh, corporation concept. And the way they did it, in this case, instead of saying that the office holders are the members, they said the shareholders are the members. So our current predicament in the US is a distant consequence of this early confusion. This, this, this interpretation has never changed. That's the way it's still treated. Uh, if one thinks of the business corporation as a member corporation, one will be inclined to think that the purpose of the corporation is only to serve its shareholder members, and one will also be inclined to grant corporations constitutional rights. Uh, I'll say a little more about that. If one instead recognizes it as a property corporation without members, stockholders are, are, are just outside investors, uh, then there's no reason that their interests alone should be primary. There are many people who contribute to the corporation. And there is no reason that constitutional rights should be attributed to the corporate entity. Uh, but even if you don't agree with me but insist that shareholders are members, it still would not follow that a corporation has their rights. In a member corporation, such as a medieval university, the mystic unity of members, so to speak, that's their language, forms a legally separate entity or person with property, liabilities, and rights wholly distinct from the members as individuals. Attributing the rights of its members to the entity would be a fallacy of composition. So all shareholders have constitutional, or so, uh, so all shareholders have electioneering rights, therefore the corporation has election, electioneering rights. All shareholders are hungry, therefore the corporation is hungry. Right, you see, you see the problem. Um, classic fallacy. So one further thing had to happen, which is that the member corporation had to be decomposed into a simple partnership, wherein the rights of the partners really are just the rights of its members. So the court's jurisprudence rests on a double confusion. First, the court construes the business corporation as a member corporation, and uh, with the shareholders as members, and second, it decomposes this into an ordinary partnership. Explaining the source of this second confusion gives me an opportunity to sneak in here some bonus material that wasn't in the paper. So if you've read the paper, there's, there's something new to chew on here. Um, so this, uh, it is in the paper, but it comes from a new piece of mine that's coming out in the APSR on the corporate origins of American constitutionalism. So in my broader project, my interest is not only in the debt of the corporation to the state, but also the debt of the state to the corporation. And this is relevant to the current story, at least tangentially, in that the corporateness of our state has had implications for how business corporations have got to be treated. So on the received view, uh, the Amer uh, American constitutionalism is an outgrowth of social contract theory, and the Constitution is a kind of social contract. In actual fact, it doesn't follow social contract theory at all, and I can say more about that, but I, I'm more interested in, in saying what it, it does follow. Uh, the Constitution, I argue, is best understood is a popularly issued corporate charter. To see this, first 
Uh, first thing to note is that the earliest American colonies were literal corporations of the crown. The Virginia Bay uh, Colony was a G Virginia Bay Company, or excuse me, Virginia Colony, Virginia Company. The Massachusetts Bay Colony was the Massachusetts Bay Company. Uh, we should not be misled by the word company into thinking that these were modern business corporations, uh, that is, these kind of authoritarian property corporations. They were settlement corporations, which in organization were more akin to the medieval towns and guilds. That is, it was a kind of member corporation. So I, I'm not about to argue that the U.S. constitutional system uh, has its roots in the business corporation, as plausible as that might seem today. Actually, its roots were in uh, these medieval member corporations. Uh, now, like all corporations, these settlement corporations had a jurisdiction, in this case territorial, and their government was authorized by and limited by a corporate charter from the king. The corporate board just was the board of, or was the government of these colonies. What needs to be emphasized is, this, is that uh, it was from this experience that Americans derived their understanding of what a constitution is, that it is a written document, a charter that authorizes and limits the government. That is not the British understanding of what a constitution is uh, then or now. That's not the medieval understanding. That's not the ancient understanding of, the, of the, you know, Aristotle or Cicero. Uh, what is more, they liked uh, oh, just, they, you know, that understanding comes from living under a corporate government. The Americans liked their governments limited by charter. They associated that with liberty, uh, freedom from arbitrary rule, Life under a sovereign government, such as parliament, they associated with despotism, even political slavery. They didn't want their governments to be sovereign. But the break with Britain left the Americans with a problem, because their existing charter governments had all been chartered by the crown, and that's who they're breaking with. This left their charter governments groundless, and unauthorized, and unlimited. And there seemed no other sovereign to turn to to reissue the charter, or write new charters. Or was there, right? So this was the Federalist innovation, is that they took this concept of a sovereign people, and they made it the sovereign to charter the, the, uh, uh, the government. So I'm going to set aside the ins and outs of how the Federalists or orchestrated this, and I'm going to turn straight to the homology to show you how this works. Oh, some older slides got, oh, this is a problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's a problem. How did that happen? My machine must have not updated in a sec. I wonder. Okay. How can I quickly I look? If I have so my laptop here, mm -hmm. is there a way to just hook that screen into my laptop? I don't know. <laughs> What does this hook into? Because I really love to show this, having gone. Um, it's an HDMI it. cord. It's connected by what? HDMI. Ooh. Yeah, I would need a converter. I've just, I've just mm -hmm. got the regular. Uh, mm -hmm. You can show us on your laptop. Okay. Well, I can. I, I'll just. I'll just read email. this. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, must be email USB. USB. And then I can open it. He has a flash drive. There's no well, USB. Yeah, you could use the yeah, USB. Flash drive. Yeah. yeah, but it's not loaded on the flash drive. Right. Well, you could load it. Wouldn't take too long. Well, I don't. You know, but okay. So okay. Just a second. All right, yeah. we'll do it. Oh, so it's the right copy. So I don't know. Okay. Yeah. You come up on that. It's gotta be worth your wait, huh? I'll edit this out and post. <laughs> yeah. <Break>. <laughs> Oh yeah, you have to get an Ethernet cord from the computer. No, it has any role. Yes, exactly. Very Okay, I saw that was my mistake. I uh, I loaded the wrong one. 
Oh, I see. So emailing it won't do any good? Okay. I just have, I just have these, a few more slides. You know, I can just, I just read them, but it's very dramatic if you can get the visual. But that's the way it Okay. All right. If you turn the computer, maybe we can see the screen. Well, um, you'll kind of. Uh, let's no, see. maybe not. Well, it'll it'll be tiny, but you'll maybe that'll maybe that'll be a view. It's a good suggestion. Okay, so I'm going to read off of this. You don't have to read it. I'll, just, I'll tell you what it says, okay, and then I'll advance the slide. Uh, so here are the traits of an 18th century corporate government. Uh, first, authorized and limited by a charter issued by the king. Owns property, makes contracts in its own name. Is a juridical person. So we've been through. Its authority re resides in the office, not in specific persons. Its officers are not legal agents of the king. They are dual fiduciaries to the members and to the purposes established in the charter. That's how a corporation works. You're not actually, it's not a principal agent relationship, it's a different kind of relationship. Uh, the king does not directly participate in the government, but the government may not act outside the bounds of the king's charter. Its statutes may not be repugnant to the king's law, that is inconsistent with its law. These restrictions are enforced by the king's courts rather than by the king directly, but the king reserves the right to amend the charter if unhappy with the way things are going. Okay, so that's one bit of control that it retains, amending the charter. Okay, so now if we substitute, oh, let, me, let me turn up that brightness, the word people for king, did you see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, but basically nothing changes, and we now have modern constitutionalism. Uh, again, I'll just read the first one, authorized and limited by a charter issued by the people. I'll just skip some of the others, we'll get down to the interesting stuff. Uh, its statutes may not be repugnant to the people's law, that is the Constitution. Uh, these restrictions are enforced by the people's courts rather than by the people directly. Uh, but the people reserves the right to amend the charter, and if, if I'm happy with the way things are going. Uh, point being here is that all the things that we think of as American constitutional innovations, constitutional conventions, written charters, judicial review, amendment of the charter, represents a transfer of corporate governance technology to the state. Now, of course, if national and state constitutions are popularly issued corporate charters, then this makes the American governments literal corporations. They have juridical personhood, they have a jurisdiction, and they are subordinate to the law of the sovereign, that is, the Constitution. And this was, indeed, how most of the key founding fathers understood it. Uh, there's only time here to, to read a couple quotes, uh, supporting passages, let me do that here. This is from James Wilson, who was one of the leading theorists of the Constitution. Uh, he, doesn't, he gets short shrift these days, but he's totally on a par with Madison. Um, the term corporation is generally applied to petty associations for the ease and convenience of a few individuals, but in its enlarged sense, it will comprehend the government of Pennsylvania, the existing union of the states, this was the confederacy he was talking about, the Articles of Confederation, and even this projected system is nothing more than a formal act of incorporation. Uh, so Wilson was a legal scholar, so they understood these legal categories and how this was being applied. Uh, here's a passage from the U.S. Supreme Court Justice. This is uh, Justice John Marshall, the long, long, longest serving Supreme Court Justice in, in American history. Uh, the United States of America is the true name of that grand corporation which the American people have formed, and the charter will, I trust, long remain in full force and vigor. 
okay? And I have folks from Madison and Hamilton, et cetera. Uh, the thing is, because people have been thinking of corporations as these voluntary associations, they've missed this or not been able to make sense of this. Once you understand that a corporation is a delegated government, then it makes sense that the people might have delegated this authority. It has a limited jurisdiction, it's delegated to the government. The people retain sovereignty, the government has a limited jurisdiction. Uh, so in sum, corporate government and modern constitutional government employ the same governance technology which the latter borrowed from the former. They are both franchise governments. Our governance is corporate all the way down. I would add one more thing, which is that constitutional states and corporations not only utilize the same governance form, but have the same authorizing sovereign. There is this difference only. One is authorized by the people directly, the other indirectly by the people's authorized governments. Right? A government, a legislature authorizes the corporations. And this strikes me as another reason to believe that any sharp distinction between the corporation as private and the constitutional state as public is untenable. So, just a couple of paragraphs to wrap up. What does all this have to do with the court's confusion of a business corporation with a partnership? Well, the underlying source of this confusion is that the business corporation, which in fact is created by the state, has in theory come to be seen as the creation of private contract, like a partnership. It has been privatized. And the first step in this privatization followed on from this American innovation of a chartered republic. That's a new kind of republic. In all previous forms of republicanism, the people was not viewed as the embodiment of the public. But in American constitutionalism, the sovereign people is pre-governmental and embodies the private. It holds reserved rights against the government, and it now embodies the public. As a result, American constitutionalism created an unprecedentedly sharp distinction between public and private. And the great liberal labor of the 19th century was to sort the nation's social institutions into one category or the other. And one kind of corporation, the town, was classified as public and became fully subordinate to the state. While the other kind of corp kinds of corporation, including the business corporation, were classified as private, with rights held against the state. Also important in this story is the advent of general incorporation laws in the middle of the 19th century. One no longer received a charter directly from the crown or legislature, but could get one simply by filing papers with the Secretary of State, so long as one satisfied a list of standard criteria. This changed the optics. Incorporation now looked a lot like a private act, or a simple act of registration. Uh, even though the state still created the corporate entity, and endowed the board, the board with, with its authority. Right? It doesn't really matter if you're getting from the legislature directly or the Secretary of State on authority of the legislature, it's still coming from the state. And last but not least is the continued penetration of liberal individualist assumptions, which are especially pronounced in neoliberalism and its academic affiliates, such as law and economics, which has clouded our ability to think in corporate terms. Corporations long predate liberalism and cannot be reduced to its categories. Yet we insist on trying and systematically misdescribe and misdiagnose them. We come to think of them as private partnerships without any duty to the public or accountability to the public or even any need for transparency to the public. And we extend them rights they ought not have, including constitutional rights. So this is how we've gotten to where we are. And my hope is to help us think corporately again so that we can come to better terms with these franchise governments of our own devising. So that's the talk. Thanks very much. Yeah. Okay, next we'll hear some comments on this and then we'll open it for general discussion. Can motion. Um, so first let me begin by thanking uh, Professor Seedley for being here today. Oh, thank you. Uh, and also Professors Paisley Cura and Robin Morasco for organizing the Political Theory Workshop uh, this semester uh, and co-sponsoring this event, and of course Carol Gould in the Center for Global Ethics and Politics for also co-sponsoring. Uh, as to the paper itself, um, your work is groundbreaking in several ways and also highly relevant to many very concrete political debates going on right now, so I'm excited to be serving uh, as discussant for your paper. 
Um, so I'll begin by providing a brief reconstruction of some of the themes that I see you developing, um, and then move on to some questions. So I see this paper is taking on several very important tasks. Uh, first, I see the paper as uh, deepening and strengthening our ability to critique legal decisions like the Citizens United uh, decision. So there have been other arguments about Citizens United, I'm sure many of you are familiar with them. Uh, other arguments about, you know, we should reject the status uh, theory of corporations and return to the grant theory. But this paper sort of explains the deeper historical reasons why the Supreme Court was able to make the arguments that it did in the first place. So in doing this historical work, this kind of archaeological work, you, in, you, re, you introduce uh, a lot of um, useful concepts that maybe haven't been part of this theoretical discussion up to this point, like the distinction between the property corporation and the member corporation, um, the sort of decomposition into natural persons, and then the composition fallacy. Uh, so these kind of these concepts that you introduce uh, uh, sort of add richness and complexity to the critique of uh, legal decisions like uh, Citizens United. And not only does this strengthen the critique of Citizens United um, and other legal decisions um, that are that are similar, uh, but in doing so, you also point to some of the deeper political and theoretical issues. Uh, that come with living in a corporate society. And so a lot of the critiques of Citizens United that I've read um, don't make a strong connection with uh, political, other political problems or political theory about the corporation as a whole. There's often like a legal critique and some kind of normative, kind of maybe implicit view. But uh, in your paper, on the other hand, you give us a really uh, strong avenue, I think, to connect the critique of Citizens United with very fundamental questions about the corporation that go just beyond de uh, denunciation of you know, corporate domination, but to a genealogy of the very concept of a corporation and what role it plays uh, in society. So your paper, I think, gives us some very productive ways of asking questions like, what kind of society do you get when you have a corporate society? What does it do to jurisprudence? What does it do to our political theoretical concepts? So that's the first, uh, first thing, I would say. Uh, uh, deepening our ability to critique uh, things like Citizens of the United. Uh, the, second, the second thing that I found very valuable in this paper is uh, I see it as a welcome corrective to the rel relative lack of attention to the business corporation in recent political theory. Uh, and an example of this would be uh, the dearth of close attention to the corporation in political theory on neoliberalism. So my general gloss on this would be that the critique of neoliberalism has tended to really focus a lot on the state, uh, which is perhaps understandable as an attempt to contest the simplistic idea that neoliberalism entails a retreat of the state. Uh, however, this emphasis on the state, however necessary, probably misses the impact of the most prominent vehicle of neoliberalism in most people's everyday life, of the corporations that employ most of us, where we actually encounter authority and power uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, and like the university that you, uh, as a corporation that you pointed to. Uh, so yeah, it, it just seems like there's been this strange kind of lack of attention to the corporation in, in sort of recent political theory. Um, this paper, I think, is a very valuable corrective to that. Uh, the, the third uh, thing that I found, among many others, that I found very valuable about your paper uh, is that it gives us a chance to reread political theory, and specifically liberal th theory, through the corporate form. So you, when you talk about franchise governments and about you know uh, Republican government as itself based on the corporate form, uh, so rather than ask what liberalism or some other theory has to say about corporations, uh, you invite us to think about how the prevalence of the corporation in society has has always already informed liberalism and other theories. So the corporation becomes not just an object of theory, not just a thing to be theorized about, 
but an organizing concept that's been there all along that maybe we weren't aware of. Uh, another way to put this is to maybe uh, the way that I, I, I read you is uh, to say that we've been speaking in corporate terms about political entities that are essentially corporations without realizing it or without realizing the full uh, implications of this. So this opens up a whole new kind of continent for thinking uh, all of our traditional theoretical concepts through this this corporate form that we fail to fully account for. So you say, for example, on page 12 of the paper that the corporate type became a model for Republican government, and then your comments at the end uh, built on that bit. So our, our conception of liberalism then has to become something other than just, say, an account of the relation between the individual and the state. The history of the liberal state, at least in the United States, is also at the same time the history of the corporation. Um, one last thing I wanted to say about what I took from the paper is, uh, so, so far this semester in the political theory workshop, we've had David Harvey talking about economic crisis and Wendy Brown talking about the neoliberal university. Uh, and I don't know how much of this was intentional, uh, but it seems to me that your paper fits very nicely uh, into this and that you kind of, there's almost like a, uh, a, a, a nice continuity between these presentations and that your your focus on the corporation adds a very important piece of the puzzle. Uh, especially when we uh, thinking about Wendy Brown's talk last month and about recent events at Harvard University with the, the, the striking workers. Um, I, I, and I, you correct me on this if I'm wrong, I, I remember reading that Harvard College is actually the oldest corporation uh, in the Western Western Hemisphere. So, so if we want to talk about like the critique of the neoliberal university, I wonder, um, you know, I I, th I think that your paper actually could 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 connect with some of the stuff we've been talking about in the workshop to this point in very, very interesting ways. Okay. So, uh, I also had some more specific questions, uh, and they all relate in some way to the issues uh, I just raised. So I have three questions. Uh, first question. Um, so your paper is primarily about the relation between the corporation and the state. Um, do you do you see your analysis as letting us also say something about relations between corporations and their employees? Uh, does it does it does it do you want to go to talking about power and authority within the corporation? So when I say this, I'm thinking of your really provocative comments in the paper about the corporation as a republic, uh, and this sort of um, story you tell about um, the, the, the evolution, or maybe de devolution, of the corporation from a republican form to a mixed constitution form to its contemporary autocratic uh, form. So this seems to me like an interesting story of like a kind of uh, corruption, like corruption in the properly Republican sense, right? Like of uh, the degeneration of civic virtue into private interest. So I wonder if this transformation of the corporation from a, from a member republic to an oligarchic autocracy, to use your words, is relevant to kind of today's discussions about things like workplace democracy and things of that nature. Is this sort of pre Republican prehistory of the business corporation relevant to these, to these uh, discussions about labor republicanism, uh, non-domination in the workplace, all this kind of stuff? So just, do, do you think that that's a productive avenue? Do you see your work as connecting with that, with that topic? That would be the first question. Uh, my second question is about the sort of social ontology of the corporation. Um, I guess I would say that the, the, the idea of the natural person is itself not necessarily self-evident or uncontested, um, especially today when the sort of the a agentic properties of non-humans is an increasingly sort of prominent theme in political theory. Um, I mean, I wonder if there's a strategic advantage to holding on to some kind of concept of, of corporate 
corporate personhood. So um, let me explain a little bit what I mean by that. Um, in the paper, you talk about the, uh, the two, two theories of the corporation, the association theory, that it's really just an association between natural persons, and then the abstract legal entity theory, which I take to be you know, your view. But there's a third theory that didn't come up in the paper, which is the sort of real entity theory. So I'm thinking of like Gierke and that Otto Gierke and Maitland and that whole tradition of thinking about, about the corporation. And I, I wonder if the corporation doesn't have a kind of abstract existence that is nevertheless real. I, I, I sometimes think of the corporation as having intentionality without subjectivity, right? Because a lot of legal cases about corporations hinge on who's responsible. And often it's, it's really difficult to identify which natural persons, which individuals are responsible for corporate decisions, uh, not just because of like legal sophistry, but because literally the structure of the corporation, the incentive structure, sort of produces certain outcomes in a way that's regular and predictable without being reducible to the decisions and subjectivity of the natural individual persons who make it up. So isn't there sort of uh, an emergent kind of entity that's larger than the sum of its parts that is the corporation? And what's the relationship of that entity to juristic personhood? Um, and just one practical sort of consequence of this is like, <coughs> If we, if, we, if we say that corporations have a life, they can also have a death. Uh, you know, if corporations are persons, we can also have the death penalty for a corporation. Um, so my, 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 my final question uh, is, is about the larger sort of political vision behind this project, which I would, I would love to, if you, if you, whatever you feel like sharing about that. Um, and specifically about sort of things like Citizens United. Just to play devil's advocate for a second, um, there, you know, there's been a lot of discussion about Citizens United. Um, but, but sometimes the critique of the corporation makes for some strange bedfellows, right? So the idea that like you can critique the corporation for its distorting effects on capitalism, you find this theme a lot in like libertarianism, um, and the kind of almost like nostalgic romance for the, the era of capitalism that was genuinely competitive, the small scale artisanal producers and all this kind of thing. So I wonder if there's um, some, some, you know, some potential risks in mounting a critique of the corporation uh, in taking us away from sort of looking at say the relation between capital and labor which I will persist, you know, regardless of what form the corporation takes. So it's not, it's not that, um, you know, I, I, th I think what you're doing is absolutely vital. It's more that, do you, do you sort of agree that there is like a potential, um, a potential risk of getting into some sort of murky territory, especially when, like I said, the, the, the critique of the corporation has some kind of co a complicated kind of history to it? Although, of course, you could, you could reply to me and say that that's precisely an advantage of the critique of the corporation, that you can build this kind of coalition with sort of different ideological groups to, to push forward progressive reforms. So I could see that being like kind of a counter to what I'm saying, but I just thought I'd kind of throw that out there. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Yeah, that was <laughs> First of all, those are very generous remarks, and uh, I really thought also, you know, very thorough and uh, just really insightful. Even listening to your uh, your comments, especially in the first half of them, you know, some of the, the the general formula, summary formulas that you came up with were very nice and even even helpful for me and, and you know how to frame this for audiences. Um, so. I will say on neoliberalism, I, I'm working on a paper right now, I'm just about to send it out. Uh, and I struggle with the title, it, it, the working title right now is just Neoliberalism and the Corporation, a Critique. Uh, because there's both 
the critique of the neoliberal corporation. The corporation is re re-theorized and reconstructed in a particular way by the Chicago School economists, uh, which has led to this kind of shareholder primacy, very short-term focus. A lot of the uh, kind of crisis of American corporate capitalism is really directly uh, uh, follows from this. Uh, the, the, the loss, the increasing inequality in pay, um, loss of or, or, or decline in research and development, decline of worker training, outsourcing, all this stuff really comes through a different theorization of the corporation just oriented toward, towards shareholders. Uh, but also there's a critique of neoliberalism itself that you get out of the corporation. You already touched on the most fundamental one is that it seems to me it's really hard to make a case for an economy without state intervention when your primary economic actors are a result of state intervention, mm -hmm. right? Um, and there's also, uh, so I've, I've a list of these critiques, but, but my other second favorite is um, uh, neoliberalism has as an ethic uh, individual responsibility, responsibility for your actions. You know, don't ask me to redistribute some of my wealth from my success to others. You know, you kind of bear responsibility for your actions. Uh, except those who control corporations are exempt from the responsibility for their own actions, right? In a corporation, if, uh, if you create a tort, like, okay, think of the BP oil oils, mm -hmm. you know, blow out, right? I mean, if, if I dump a battery in the, in the, in the, in the you know, creek behind my yard, I'm going to get a fine or whatever it is. I'm personally liable. But if, if you know, you're a CEO and, and, and you make decisions that lead to blow out of the well in the Gulf, you go yachting to take your mind off it because it's just a dispute over which legal entity is going to bear that, that, that liability and that payment. Is it the BP legal entity or the subcontractor legal entity, right? Those who control do not bear the consequences of their control in a corporation. Neither do the shareholders. So we're creating this world where uh, those who control and uh, are exempt from individual responsibility, whereas, you know, the workers and the consumer, you know, so the strong are exempt, the weak, once again, are the ones who have to bear their individual responsibility, the bankruptcy laws being cut, you know, welfare the state being reduced, etc. Uh, so, so anyway, yeah, there's a very powerful critique, I think, of, of neoliberalism, so I'm going to be writing more about that. But let me just say, I don't want to, I want to hear some more from the audience, so let me just, but let me, let me try and do, uh, uh, if not full justice, at least touch on each of your three questions. Um, so you're right that my real focus, where I think there's been a lack of attention, is on the relation between the corporation and the state, rather than, than the internal governance, the internal relations of the corporation, meaning you know, manager uh, worker relations. Um, but you're, you're right, I mean, I do think that is in, important. Um, and I, I've already, you know, published just a few thoughts on, on that. Um, you know, one about the rights of workers. Uh, it, it's kind of interesting how, um, you know, with the incorporation of the Bill of Rights through the 14th Amendment, now that these, these Bill of Rights apply to state and local government, like to towns, as well as to the federal government. Uh, but towns and business corporations are both the same kinds of entity. They're both these little chartered governments, chartered by the state. So a town is not allowed to infringe on freedom of speech, freedom of association, etc., of its members, yet management of a business corporation is. We say the Bill of Rights stops at the company gate, right? This is all considered a private sphere. So, so why doesn't the Bill of Rights also apply within the, within the business corporation? I think there's some reasons why you wouldn't have it applied to the full extent, just as the same way like an employee of the government, right, is bound by certain kind of you know, secrecy laws, et cetera, and that's going to also apply, but it doesn't seem to me like the, the Bill of Rights should just be gutted once you enter the, the workplace, if it's a, if it's a corporate uh, business. So that would be one kind of, kind of area. And I do think this, this new work I'm doing on property corporations versus member corporations, I mean, yeah, there's, there's a way to, to tell this is that historically we, we, we got the wrong corporation, right? The, because the member corporation is a lot like a producer's co-op, whereas a business corporation is, is, is a, a kind of uh, investor's, you know, what I call oligarchic, you know, autocracy. Um, and it turns out that in practice, co-ops are much more successful than people believe. The general problem is you know, the startup capital is hard to get, 
and the kind of organizational cost. But once they're up and running, their success rate, I think, is no worse than that of a, a typical investor-managed uh, uh, firm. Uh, so I think that can at least help in drawing attention, again, to these issues of republicanism within the firm and, uh, and kind of worker co-ops. Um, so I, I appreciated your point on the social, social ontology of the corporation. Uh, and you mentioned, uh, so the three main theories of the corporation, the one that, that I uh, advocate for is the original one, it was the one for centuries, it was the only one uh, initially, was, was the, the, the concession theory, grant theory, that the corporation is a creation of the state. Uh, and, and I mean that, that the corporate entity is a creation of the state. The firm is a hybrid because there's that entity from the state, but there's also the employees and the financing, which, which are privately, so it's a public-private hybrid. Uh, but anyway, so, so I, I subscribe to that view. There's also the associational view, that's what I critiqued today, but there's this real entity view, uh, as you say, coming out of Gierka, that those, the, the members or those affiliated with the association, maybe those employees, their interactions create a kind of will of the group that is distinct from the will of any individual member of that. Um, and the question is, you know, what, what might that will of the association have, how that might that relate to, to the juristic personhood of the corporation? So some of you may know Philip Pettit's work on this, and Pettit and List, Pettit and, and, uh, List uh, co-wrote a, a book on group agency. And I've had numerous conversations with him, and I, and, and I, I think I've dissuaded him from his original view. Uh, but they seem to initially present this that the, this notion of a group will makes sense of the notion of juridical personhood because this is a, a way in which, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the crucial features of group agency with them is this capacity for responsibility, for getting feedback and making changes in response to, you know, how you're interacting with the environment. So there's this responsibility. And, th and th this notion of a, of a juridic person uh, that is responsible and liable is, is kind of under, underpinned by that. It turns out that just couldn't be more wrong. Uh, so first of all, the, the, the rights and, and liabilities of the juristic person, that is just a mandate of the state. If you look at how the business, just take the business corporate as an example, what I've just described in my critique of neoliberalism, um, not only is the corporate form not a form in order for that group to bear responsibility, it's a form in which that group gets out of all liability. All liability is borne by the legal entity. If you're a group operating in a corporation, right, no individual member of that, so the classic way the groups work, okay, so uh, if you go back to the Roman family, if you look at uh, tribes, if you look at um, the Capulets versus the Montagues, or the Bloods versus the Crips, or the Hatfields versus the McCoys, the general rule is, uh, not only is each individual responsible for their own actions, but they're also responsible for the actions of every other member of the group. That's how you get these blood feuds, right? In the corporation, it's the case that not only is the individual not responsible for their own action, it's borne by the corporate entity. They're also not responsible for the action of any other member in that group. It's borne by the corporate entity. No natural person is liable for either the debts or the torts of that corporate entity, of that group, right? It's all borne by the corporate entity. So as opposed to what they initially presented as a, as a way to kind of, you know, bring liability to the groups, it exempts liability from the groups. So there's, there's, a, there's no logical, no historical connection between these two things. So, so I appreciate you bringing that up, but it's only, it's something that I emphasize as, you know, if there's new literature emerging on this, I'm going to have to intervene on it. It involves a lot of my friends, and this can be painful, but, but this is absolutely wrong. You're missing the fundamental point, right? It's keeping these distinct that, that is, I think, crucial for understanding how our economy is working. Uh, so, and then the, the third, the larger vision. So, um, so I'm very hard on corporations in my work. Um, and I, I guess I, I'm always a, a glass half empty kind of guy. I mean, in my first publication on, and, and, and some here I think have read it thanks to Carol, the 2013 APSR piece, you know, I do have, uh, I lay out this economic theory of the business corporation and why, under certain circumstances, it's preferred to partnerships and proprietorships. Uh, and, you know, amazingly, that there was no theory. Economists, for long time, didn't have a theory of a firm. They don't have a theory of the corporation. Why do you choose a corporate form over a partnership or a proprietorship? Economists think these legal rules don't matter. I think, I think they're crucial. 
Uh, but in any case, and so that you, so so I do see the positive side of what corporations can do. But you're right that I really focus, you know, given our historical moment <laughs> and just my natural critical nature, I focus on the uh, the uh, downsides of them. Uh, but my answer isn't to dissolve all corporations, and I think you know this stuff on, on constitutional that I talked about. This is so deeply embedded in the way that Westerners construct social order and governance. The corporate form is, I think, the distinctive institutional form of the West. Uh, it's, it was used, for, like, where other civilizations, you know, used extended kin networks and so forth. You know, the Catholic Church, it's a complicated story, the Catholic Church uh, um, uh, puts in rules in place to kind of dissolve those. And so the corporation was the form in which individuals associated. And so the rise of towns and guilds and, 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 and uh, universities, etc. Uh, and that's the way in which Westerners have, have organized and augmented collective power. And it just pervades Western. So, you, so I don't see getting rid of the corporation, uh, but, but I certainly am a reformist. Um, and uh, it's, it's maybe a bit much to go into. I, I've been myself trying to, to struggle with what, kind of, what my reform agenda will look like. Um, but certainly just from looking at what the... Um, the most problematic, low-hanging fruits of the corporation are, they are things like the fact that we compensate CEOs in over 80% stock and stock options, which totally orients them toward the short-term uh, stock price, especially given the shareholders now are typically the institutional investors that, that hold stock for a very short period of time. So I can't remember the dates exactly, but you know, like 30 years ago, the average stock was held for about six years, and now it's four months, right? So the time frames is real. So and, and that leads them to there's all sorts of you know, ledger domain they, they they engage in, but ultimately you, you can't do long-term investment. The whole point of the, the business corporation was to do long-term growth, long-term products. You lock in capital; it can be specialized to a particular production uh, uh, function. Um, at, at, and, and the short-term focus just undermines the whole point of it. Right? You cut your research and development, you cut your worker training, it becomes very short-term. Uh, and this is, in fact, why we see more and more companies going for alternative forms like the LLC, and things that aren't publicly traded, where you don't have that shareholder pressure. If you're really interested in building your company, you don't want to be a publicly traded corporation. It, didn't always, it wasn't always that way, that's what it is. So changing the way CEOs are compensated, uh, making some adjustments in liability. I like this idea of nonprofit foundations owning and controlling amount of shares of companies, which relieves them from, this is, this is typical in Denmark, actually, which relieves uh, that short-term pressure, uh, uh, because now it's a nonprofit holding it. So anyway, so I, I sent some ideas I'm, I'm cooking up, but um, uh, I can see how one would read my work and think that I, I just want to slash and burn all corporations. But really, I, I want to try to be more. <laughs> All right, I'll leave it there. Thanks okay, so much, Cameron. we will uh, take uh, questions. Uh, Josh? Um, so, I like the paper. I thought it was great. Um, Thanks, Josh. I'm interested in this idea of jurisdiction yeah. and this sort of like, oh, let's, let's keep this model going and like, we'll explain everything with this model of the corporation. And I'm just wondering, there are some things that seem somewhat disanalogous between, like, for instance, the United States and a normal corporation. So like one is the ability to use coercion, like coercions, you know, corporations usually aren't able to do that. They can't tax their members, things like that. Um, so I wonder, I mean, one way to put that would be that like the legal system of the United States actually seems to have to, you know, Joseph Ross would say it, it makes this claim to authority over everything, a certain unlimited amount of authority, because it makes the claim to be able to dispute and draw the lines around where the limits of its own authority are. Um, and it seems like that's not true of corporations, right? Like they're they're authorized, they're subordinate to. Um, it's a way of thinking about that is that like you know a township, normally they're subject to the constitution, right? But not like state law. It, usually, usually the way that states and the federal government subject them to state and federal law is through budgetary concerns, right? If you don't comply with like local state, you know, regulations and, and, and federal law, then you won't be able to use state or federal um, money to do various things. Like you won't you won't qualify for various programs that the 
principals want to do. So I'm just wondering, like, if you think that that, I mean, to me that seems like a different in kind once you have this idea of, like, we're going to grant jurisdiction, but in the grant is a limit to the jurisdiction in a way that I, I'm just not sure if that really is ha the right way to think about, like, the con setting up the constitution of, like, the federal government, right? Like, the highest sort of authority in the land. I mean, I, I at least think Joseph Ross would have to argue. I mean, I don't think he thinks authority is unlimited, but it kind of has to be in this almost Schmidtian sense, right? That it decide who, he, who, who decides the exception has ultimate power type of thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I just don't know what to do. Okay, great. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, so, so let me take a couple of these points. So, uh, the way I do frame this, I say that they kind of, you know, I use this, this word uh, intentionally, that kind of fundamentally the only difference is, I, you know, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to draw people's attention to all the similarities, right? Uh, so so I, I take your point that there's some differences, but I would hold that the more differences of degree than kind. Uh, and so uh, on the issue of, say, coercion, uh, so, so first of all, some of these earlier corporations, like the Dutch East India Company, English East India Company, uh, they were granted in their charter the authority to make war, to make treaties, to make peace, to mint coin, to imprison people. They were basically creating fully, you know, what we would call fully sovereign governments, right? Uh, but they were giving them a limited jurisdiction in terms of, of the territory. You're, you're over there, we're here. <laughs> um, over time, it was realized the dangers of that, and so we don't, we, the charters don't give corporations those kinds of powers. But in principle, they could. Um, and certainly, even business corporations, other kind of corporations today, they do have the right to you know, discipline their employees. They don't get to imprison them. They don't get to put them to death. <laughs> um, but you know, they can shame them. They can demote them. Uh, I don't really think it's anyone that institutes fines. But you could actually do that. I, I just don't think it's, 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 it's practice. So, so I, I do think it, it, it's, it's, it's there a, ma a matter of, of degree. Um, and on, on RAS, uh, I disagree with that whole Eurocentric take on the state, um, which used to be true of the European states. It's not true of the American state, and it's no longer true of the European states. So I understand that in practice, it's pretty dang close to what he's talking about. Certainly, in theory, it's different. But I think even the theory does have some um, uh, bite to it. And so there is a difference in practice. So what I'm, what I'm saying is this. Um, European discourse says the state is sovereign. In American discourse, it's the people who are sovereign. And the government is not sovereign. And the founder's idea is the government has a limited jurisdiction. What is it limited by? It's limited by the people's charter which includes you know, very specific rules about how the government has to, to function, what its procedures are. The government actually doesn't get to set its own procedure. I mean, in, in detail it does. But you know, the government doesn't get to set its own rules for how senators are elected. How you know, These are all laid out in the chart, what the procedures are. This would be totally different than like, the king in England, who, who is, is you know, the, authorities, the sole authority of the whole executive branch and judicial branch. The king really can make it. So that goes with the kind of sovereign state concept. But, but the American system in all modern constitutions that have these kind of written charters uh, don't really work that way. So, so the, the sovereign is still the people, and the people can intervene, and it's, it's not bound in terms of what kind of amendments it can make. It can make the craziest amendments you might imagine. Okay? But the government itself is kind of bound by, by this charter. Uh, so that is, at least theoretically, a very important distinction, and I think even in practice that, that is uh, an important distinction. Um, so, and I'll say just one more historical point on this. Um, Americans, too, in the founding period, talked about the state as sovereign. But what they meant by the state was the early modern, the original concept of the state, which is a kind of corporate unity of the subjects or, or the, of the, the citizens, the people, in other words. State and people were, were synonyms, as in Locke's Commonwealth. Those are all synonyms. Um, so they would say, yes, the state is sovereign, the state is the people, and they authorize a, a, a limited government, a limited jurisdiction. Um, OK, so that's, yeah, that's how I would. In the back, and then Virginia. Thank you for a very excellent talk.
Um, I'm Grace Davy in history at Queens College. Um, I was really interested in your description of the 19th century as a time of intent, sort of sorting out of public and private. And I'm kind of curious about how, why you periodize it that way. I mean, what was happening? Or, I'd like to hear more about that because it seems to me like we're still living in a time of intense and productive anxiety about where that line between public and private should be. Yeah. Uh, it seems to be that's part of a lot of our discourse around neoliberalism. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just yeah. curious about what, how you see the 19th century and what was specific. Kenneth Pomerantz talks about the early 1800s and the train technology and um, you know the, the way in which technology allowed a modern Western corporation to emerge in a distinctive way. Yeah. Um, and I guess also to the extent you're talking about the founding fathers and their ideas, is slavery part of this story? And if not, why not? Or mm -hmm. should it? How might it be? Okay, good question. So, just a, a, an observation first about the, the public-private distinction, um, which is really more, it's more a, a normative distinction than a, a descriptive distinction. Uh, what I mean by that is, uh, uh, we don't strictly call something uh, private because there's absolutely no role of the state involved in it, or, or public because there is some little... Uh, and let me get and, and we, we love to be we love dichotomies. And let me show you how complicated this public-private distinction works with respect to corporations, and how you just get this normative classification of entities through this uh, reiterated embedding of the concept of public-private. So you have publicly traded corporations, which you might call public corporations, and then you have private corporations, which are not publicly traded, okay? And then of those publicly traded corporations, you may have some that are utilities, right? And so they have, they're more public than the other publicly traded ones. So there's the, 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 the public in terms of the, the uh, um, you know, public regulation of it now versus the other. Um, I know I'm missing, a lead. there's like two more layers. I, uh, I went in. Um, I won't be able to think of them now. But anyway, my point being is that, um, you know, we, we just kind of reproduce this. It's part of the reason why we get confused when we talk about public and private. And you can often place something both in the category of public or private, depending upon what level uh, you're talking on. Uh, so with respect to the 19th century, um, you know, prior to that, with respect to corporations, just the term for a corporation, a synonym for it, was a body politic, as opposed to a body naturally. And the idea was that it was a creation of political art, right, as an artifice. Um, and so they didn't fuss with this whole public-private distinction. The government was a body politic, a creation of art, and so was this corporation a body politic, a creation of art. And there wasn't this obsession with that. Uh, and that really starts going, like in the first decade of the, of the 19th century in the U.S., uh, you see a distinction being drawn between public and private corporations. What's going on there? Uh, the Americans were extremely wary of corporations. They'd seen what happened with the East India Company. East India Company even plays some role in the American War of Independence. Um, their republicanism, the whole valence of the corporation had changed. Um, in the Middle Ages, the phrase was Stadt Luft macht frei, right? City air makes free. Because if you could escape from your feudal lord for a year, and get into one of these little urban republics, right? You had the kind of the liberty of the, of, the, of the city as opposed to the authoritarianism of the countryside. With, with, with you know, the, the, the American founding, now the whole country is considered a, 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 a republic, uh, at least if you're, you know, white and male. And the corporations are now these property corporations which are authoritarian. So now you have these little authoritarian pockets. So the Americans are very concerned about this and they would, they would talk about the problem of imperium in imperio, or sovereignty within sovere sovereignty. As you're every time you charter a corporation, you're carving out this new little jurisdiction that's going to be authoritarian within this broader Republican uh, soup. Uh, so they're very concerned about these, but they want to do all these public improvements, and so they're chartering corporations at an unprecedented rate because their states don't have the capacity administratively in terms of their tax base in order to do this. So they use the tried and true way of organizing private capital in order to take the under, under these public works, canals, roads, bridges. And so you can use the charter as a device 
you, you only grant a charter for a project with a clear public benefit, but you incentivize private capital by allowing them to make a profit on it, right? Again, it's kind of hybrid model. Um, and banks had become so intertwined with the economy that the federals in particular just started to say, well, these are like public corporations, even though we know they're created, uh, or excuse me, these are private corporations, even though they're created by the state, we have to give them some higher level of protection. You can't just have the, the, the legislature rescinding the charter of a bank and cause a, you know, collapse and, you know. So, so that's really where it, it, it starts, uh, how, um, I guess just important some of these are, a feeling that you had to give them this increasing level of protection. Uh, and then that's, that's kind of the beginning of the story and the further sorting going on after that. Virginia. Uh, one of your fairly clear, or I should say very clear, recommendations was that corporations should not have constitutional protection, should not be thought to have constitutional rights. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you think that could be brought about? Could it just be brought about by um, uh, judicial, new judicial decisions? Would you have to have um, legislation, which at the present time might then be considered uh, unconstitutional? Uh, would you have to change the Constitution? How could you bring that about? Okay. Uh, good question. So, I mean, certainly amendment is always a way to do it. It's just, it's just very difficult. Um, you know, part of the reason that, well, this certainly is, is true in my case, I imagine not, I'm not alone, are so anxious about the, the Senate and who's going to get to appoint this uh, ninth justice, and will the Senate even appoint a ninth justice if it's, you know, if there's, if it's in Republican hands, they have Democratic president, or um, because you know, a, a change of vote would overturn Citizens United, and it'd be very likely that Hillary Clinton would support would appoint someone uh, who wants to overturn that decision. Uh, so in that case, you can just change the composition of the court. Um, it's it, at this point in time, it probably is unlikely that that all the different constitutional rights that they have acquired uh, would be overturned. Uh, we've learned to live with, with men like, you know, a, a constitutional protection against search and seizure. Uh, now, prosecutors actually really don't like that, and they think that really does give corporations a lot of protection. They're basically getting these kind of privacy rights, and if these things are chartered by the public, why can't... You, there used to be something called visitation, and every corporation has a visitor, and their job was to occasionally come by and make sure that the charter was being followed, that everything was going, you know, the governance was, was well run, everything was going according to plan. Um, and, and now, there still is formally a visitor, it's the state attorney general, but of course they never actually visit, it's just kind of the formal categories carried on. Uh, and and the, the writing is search and seizure prevents you having a visitor in a more robust, robust form. But anyway, I, I'm, doubt, I'm doubting that will get uh, overturned. Um, but probably the, most, the easiest way to overturn some of these would simply be a, a, a change in the composition of the court. But of course, you also have to make the legal argument about you know why it's wrong for them to have these constitutional rights in the first place, and so that's uh, that's, that's what go, I'm doing. You wanted to go a lot further than just overturn Citizens United. Yeah, that's right. All, all I, I these was rights. I about I, the longer range. Aim. Yeah. So I, I mean, practically, I, I I realize that some of these are probably not going to be overturned, but I do think it's it's illegitimate from a legal point of view for them to have any constitutional rights. It just makes no sense to me. You think of it this way, to put it in more general terms. Uh, government creates these entities and endows them with their rights. Uh, that was the original understanding for centuries and centuries. Uh, Marshall, uh, that the second sense of the famous line, that a corporation is invisible and tangible, existing in only in contemplation of the law. Um, as a creation of the state, it has only what rights its charter endows it with. And I think that is the correct view. How is it that you have a government-created entity that can then hold rights against the government that created it? That doesn't make sense to me, right? Uh, so, so, yeah, just on legal logic, I think it's an illegitimate position. And on policy grounds, I think it's also a, a bad position. 
Okay, I want to just jump in for a second. Okay, Emily first. I just had a follow-up question. Because yeah. I had the same question, but I was wondering if you have a sense of which of the arguments that you make people might be more amenable to adopting, like is for, to sort of get people to vote on that logic that it's legally inconsistent, Do uh, is it likelier that the uh, emphasis of the property um, corporation rather than the member corporation would be something that would gain traction or would it, do you think the, the sort of like decomposition of it into natural persons route would be more attractive to legal yeah, actors? I think, so the idea that shareholders are the owners of the corporation uh, is an ideology that's rapidly collapsing, I'm very happy to, to say. Now this, I mean, you still, you pull uh, you know, corporate law professors and a majority would still probably give you a line but in the past year, it went from like almost no one who would question the idea that shareholders are owners to a very sizable and vocal uh, minority, and I think all the, the momentum is with them. Uh, so that is helpful. And then on the membership concept, I think, I think um, rather the, than the revival of the property corporation versus the member corporation, it is just a better understanding of what a member corporation was and that a business corporation is not a partnership, right? So that decomposition thing seems to be the more likely argument to gain uh, sway. And I'll just say, in terms of who the audience is, here, I th it really isn't the general voter. I think it's the legal intelligentsia that, that you have to uh, uh, reach. Uh, bear in mind that all these rights that have been given to corporations, none of these are the result of legislation. This has always been the federal court, you know, against the legislation you know, granting these rights to corporations. This has totally been a, a legal elite driven um, development. And so I think it's the legal elite you have to address to undo it. And I want to just jump in with two questions. Uh, one is sort of uh, related, um, and one, well, sort of building on what Cam was saying um, in terms of, well, all right, actually, I guess I have three. If we looked at them as member corporations, would that help with the question of responsibility? I mean, if we transformed them into, assuming it could be done somehow, would that be sufficient uh, to kind of um, enable some, still some notion of corporate responsibility while having some relation to everyone who is part of it, whether they be all workers or also managers, having bearing some uh, responsibility, so that's mm -hmm. one question. And also, just the other one is about, I only limit it to two, um, uh, just the methodology about giving so much of a role to, to the legal form uh, as opposed to the actual social functioning of the corporate ship, is it, of, of firms, yeah. <laughs> of the whole uh, mm -hmm. sort of actual, I think you were uh, getting at that as well. It, it makes me a bit uneasy uh, to think that we can just return to some original legal form as a kind of basis for critique because it seems to be getting it in, in, inverted in terms of the usual critical approach would look at the actual social function as giving rise to legal forms. I mean, you can see that to some degree in the attribution of of uh, constitutional rights, which is driven by the interests of capitalism and political economic formation. Um, but your whole approach seems to be privileging the legal form as a basis for critique, and I'm just not sure that that would suffice for all the purposes of criticism that we might want to pursue. Mm -hmm. You were just at two. That, that's, a, that's what okay. I said. I'm, I'm right. cutting back to two. Right. Um, because, well, this, the subtext of the member corporation is not just with respect to responsibility, but in terms of worker democracy, yeah. it would require a reformulation in terms of giving, looking at redefining who the members are mm -hmm. from uh, the stockholders to the, all the employees within it. So that would have the additional benefit, and presumably, of enabling more democracy at work. Mm -hmm. So it's both with respect to responsibility questions and with respect to our um, it's like, you know, ideal of democracy at, mm -hmm. in, at work. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, so whether it's a member corporation or property corporation, in each case, 
uh, so whether it's like shareholders or the members, uh, they would be exempt, uh, just the corporate rules are, they would be exempt from the liability. The liability would be borne by the corporate right. entity. I mean, you still want so, some limited liability. You don't yeah. want them to lose all their... Well, well, I'll tell you why. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult question. There, there's massive moral hazard created by the fact that those who control don't bear liability or responsibility yeah. for their actions. On the other hand, you simply couldn't get corporations on the scale that we have, or even near the scale that we have, without that. And I've, you know, I, I've been able to see this in, in the historical record. Uh, the Dutch uh, East India Company, uh, it had a problem of achieving the, the efficient scale, a scale that would allow them to, to, to pursue these dual mandates of um, uh, making money through trade and war. And just to explain the war thing is that this, the Dutch Republic was still a fragile break off from, the, the, uh, from Spain and the Estates General wanted to use this company to attack Spanish and Portuguese interests in Asia to relieve pressure off the homeland. Okay, So it wanted to, to do war and trade. And the thing was the initial company the merchants were, were liable for, uh, for the debts of that company, and um, they weren't willing to take out the, the amount in loans that you would need to get to the scale that you needed to operate in Asia in a belligerent fashion, with building fortifications, etc., if they were going to be liable for it. And so, in, in the, I mentioned the date 1623, that's when the court allowed the company to issue bonds they were not co-signed by the merchants. So that, so that bond was only backed now by the assets of this corporate entity, now created essentially a corporate entity with property separate from the merchants. And with that move, then the merchants who controlled were willing to take on lots and lots of debt because it was now borne by the entity, right? So you got the scale. And so that's just an example of, that's, that's the emergence of this limited liability for the directors in order to solve this problem of scale. And the same problem would be true of any large industry now, right? Who is going to run these things if they're going to be personally liable for the, you know, super mm -hmm. side? So, so it's a real problem. We're, we're caught between, you know, major moral hazard or not having anything to undertake these projects. The alternative would be the state would have to undertake. It would be the state running all the oil companies, the state doing you know, all the auto companies, you know, every, you know. So I would like to see some kind of middling position where there's some... You can, you can set rules however you want in terms of the, the statutes that govern corporations and have some kind of you know, you know, more modest degree of, of liability for torts that management would bear. Uh, that would be not total liability, but you know, equivalent to a, a year's worth of salary that they could be liable you know, for torts or something like that. It's just at this point an idea. It might be hard to flesh out. But that, that's. So your second question is a, a, a very fundamental one. I, I get it a lot. So I get questions from both the left and the right that, that wonder if these legal forms really matter. From the right, the point, the, the point is you can do anything you want with contract. We don't need the corporate form. You just do this all with contract. It's kind of law and economics the approach or neoclassical you know, economic approach. Um, and I think that's wrong. And um, the left says, and I'm not going to associate that, but maybe you'll cop to it, um, that it's all capital. And capital just gets its way. And, and if capital needs a new legal form, capital will, will get a legal form created for itself. right? So it's just superstructure. And I, I disagree with both of those uh, positions. Uh, uh, nah, for, yeah, I don't know. You know what? Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> that was too extreme. Okay, so I'll it come back to, to your, your detail. Well, let me just, okay, so I won't address that to you. I'll just make that point in general, okay? There's a critique from both the right and the left. Legal forms don't matter. I think they do. Um, so I don't think it is the case that you would get these kinds of large, uh, institutions, whether economic or, or educational, right, these corporations, uh, without this legal form. I don't think you can say this legal form is a kind of addition to um, this social formation. You would never get, get the social formation without the legal form. Um, well, I'm not sure what... You've only got the legal, you've got the legal form as determinative, in a way, or you're hoping, or yeah. 
As I'm saying it's to a there being an interaction between. Oh well, them. I'm just saying it's a precondition for it's one of the preconditions for it. It's one of the conditions of possibilities, maybe a better way to put it, uh, of having these social formations. And again, the history will, will bear this out. Um, there's a kind of myth that uh, has been circulated that those clever English lawyers in the 18th and 19th century were able to use the law of trusts and of contract to more or less reproduce the corporate form, get all the benefits of the corporate form, even though it was very difficult in that period to actually get a charter uh, from Parliament. Uh, but it turns out that's, that's a myth. Um, they were constantly applying for charters, and if they couldn't get them, they would adopt what's called joint stock form, which is clearly viewed by then as an inferior, it's just a kind of partnership, uh, as an inferior form. And, and we have good evidence that that's true because as soon as Parliament made the corporate form, uh, what we call a general incorporation law, available to anyone who just satisfied these general criteria, just open the doors to it, there's just a rush of all these joint stock companies to incorporate, right? So, you can, so um, that's more, I guess, a critique of the idea of the from, from just you know, contract uh, property law. Um, but, you know, so, so I guess maybe I, we're not disagreeing, but it's just an emphasis. You know, I think these legal forms are, you know, fundamental to how these things function, to their ability to have the scale they have, to the way in which liability is apportioned, uh, and also you wouldn't get the kind of scale you have unless liability were court apportioned, something like the way it, it is. Um, so, I mean, yes, I guess I'm, I, I'm really emphasizing the legal part because it's been neglected by, by so many people. Um, but I wouldn't say it's, I don't know if this is what you're, you're thinking, that, that just you change the law and these things automatically emerge. There is then this complicated interaction yeah, with you know, labor and capital over time, et cetera. Yeah, I certainly agree with that. Yes. Hello, Carlo Benicia from City College. I also found your, your paper and your project really fascinating. Um, in particular, very fascinating what you didn't have in the paper, the part about the constitutionalism. Uh -huh. But I am going to ask a, a question about the, what the, the, the paper. Okay, sure. uh, and it may or may not be a version of the previous question. I agree with your conclusion and the, and the purpose, which is to criticize uh, granting constitutional rights to corporations. I'm not sure if you can do it by, I'm not sure if the question is legal means, but by definitional means. Basically what you're saying is, there are two types of corporations, uh, member corporations and property corporations, and the Supreme Court got it wrong as to what these corporations actually are. But at the same time you want to say corporations are just juridically created entities. So how can uh, the Supreme Court get wrong what it is constituting? Uh, the point is, why cannot, you're saying they're confusing two categories. Why are they not just creating a third kind of category, which are corporations which have some features of the members and some features of the property uh, corporations? Your argument for saying that uh, corporations should not be treated as member corporations is that in medieval member corporations, uh, members had republican rights of self-government in today's right in, and they don't but because corporations are purely artificial entities why can't the supreme court create and meddle and give them the rights they want to if it's just a purely definitional question okay um, so just one distinction which maybe will help uh, so it is never the, the judges who are creating these uh, corporate entities uh, these are created by charters uh, in the U.S. by the states, um, occasionally by the federal government. In most countries, by the fed, their, their, their central government. Um, what the court is doing is then, you know, kind of adjudicating this question of, you know, what, what the rights are going to be. Um, and again, I mean, it, it isn't really the court's role. And it wouldn't see it as its role to kind of decide what would be useful and helpful rights for the corporation to have and therefore give them, they really do see themselves as, as bound by the text of the Constitution in some sense and trying to figure out what kind of rights you know, flow from that because uh, constitutional rights in our political metaphysics can only be granted by the people. That's the, the sovereign in this situation. Uh, and so what I'm criticizing is the kind of reasoning that they're using to get 
to constitutional rights for corporations from this charter, right? Um, so I'm kind of just restating my, my position. I don't know if that was helpful or not, but I, I, I maybe if you want to yeah. make a, ask a follow-up. Okay. Maybe not. Oh. Or not. Was there uh, someone else? No? Oh, yeah, let me just take uh, some sure. of us. Uh, David. All right. Um, I thought your talk was very interesting and very thought-provoking, but I guess if I were to target one area, I'm not sure how effective it is as a criticism of the Citizens United decision. Mm -hmm. Part of this is because of my personal belief that I'm not sure how helpful it would be to conclude that corporations can't do electioneering, but rich individuals can, which would seem to be the conclusion. Like, I don't know if that really makes much, mm -hmm. makes much, makes much progress. Uh, but furthermore, I guess... Uh, how should I put this? So, when looking at your graph of um, the corporation, uh, the corporate form, the one relationship you don't actually explain is the relationship between the corporation and the board. Um, and it seems to me that if we are to, you know, play devil's advocate for people like Scalia, um, you might say, that, well, they got the members wrong. The shareholders aren't really the members, but, you know, the board, which really controls the corporation and the state of the operations, those seem like a much more... Um, accurate target to say these are the members of the corporation. Um, and, in, and in that sense, I'm, because the corporation really is a fictional entity that doesn't really exist, if you're saying that the corporation can't engage in electioneering, it appears to me you're really saying it's just the board can't engage in electioneering. Um, and I think that might bring up the criticism again that, you know, since the board is made up of individuals who are sort of, you know, form this form of partnership kind of, you are sort of inhibiting their freedom of speech rights if we really do take electioneering to be an example of free speech. Did that, was that mm -hmm. coherent? Was that coherent? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, thanks. So, um, so let me first address a question that you didn't even raise okay. about the Citizens United decision, because I know many people are interested in this case. Uh, and there w is one argument that was made by the majority uh, that I didn't address in this paper, um, but it's what many legal commentators have come to cluster around as the really you know, persuasive argument in the, in the case. And, and the argument is that um, the court is not defending the right of the corporations to speak it's defending the right of the public to listen. Mm -hmm. And it's the right of the listeners that's being protected. Um, so that therefore, the, 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 the free speech is independent of the identity of the speaker. It's just about the listeners. Okay, so, and that's, that's in, uh, there's a kind of shotgun approach in that, in that case, a variety of arguments being made, and that was one of them. And people seem like that best. But that argument is a red herring. And I'll, I'll just quickly show that. So two years later, there was a case, uh, Blumen v. FEC. This was a case involving a Canadian uh, who wanted to electioneer, spend money in American elections, and filed suit and cited the Citizens United decision case. And the circuit court rejected that, and the Supreme Court gave a summary affirmation upholding the, the circuit court's uh, rejection. Uh, so it, it turns out that when push comes to shove, the court does care about the identity of the speaker. The speaker needs to be a citizen, right? So they're not going to allow, you know, a sovereign state like China to spend money in our corporations, a Saudi prince to spend money in, in our elections, right? Uh, so very quickly gets back to this issue of what's the connection between corporations and citizenship. So, uh, so now to your specific uh, questions. Uh, so you're right that that my if Buckley v. Vallejo stands, my position would not allow corporations to spend money in elections, but would allow wealthy individuals. I think your issue is with Buckley v. Vallejo, and I agree with you on that. Um, but you know, getting solving from a policy point of view, solving half the problem is better than none, none at all. So, um, all right. Now, with respect to uh, the board, I, I think I failed to really put a punctuation point on what is wrong with um, the board spending these corporate funds. Uh, so, so even if you would take the board to be the members of the corporation, you know, you know I'm going to disagree with that, but let's hypothetically, let's, let's take it. Uh, 
it would still be crystal clear that they are not spending their personal resources when they are electioneering using the corporate treasury. Right? So I don't think anyone's confused about that. That's why the, the decision, the general confusion is to think that those funds are the funds of the shareholders. So that the board is just, you know, representing the shareholders, being a spokesperson on behalf of the shareholders, spending their money on their behalf. Uh, but here's the flaw in that. The, the whole point of the corp, so the shareholders have their own funds, right? They, have, they can spend those funds as much as they want in the election. Their rights are, are totally protected. They also own these things called shares of stock. They also own art, okay? Two different kinds of investment. <laughs> If they want to take the value of those investments and turn it into, into uh, uh, electioneering funds, they can sell those investments, right? They're similar in that way, okay? But none of those have anything to do with them having ownership claim on the treasury of the corporation. Those belong to the corporate entity. So all we're really doing is allowing the board to spend the funds of these abstract legal entities with their own weird interests in our, in our campaigns. Uh, so. Um, so I hope that clarifies it, and, and, and in no case, though, would, would you think that that's somehow restricting the board members from spending their money, that the treasury is not their money, and they too are, are welcome to spend as much as they want of their own personal resources in the election. Okay, I'm sure we have a lot of other questions, but we can ask them uh, at our reception, where people will be uh, invited to drink and so forth. So let's uh, thank uh, David. Thank you.